Hey now, it is Dan Aberhart here, today's host of the Growing the Future podcast. We're back for Season 3, Episode 17. Do not forget to check out our YouTube channel and our socials and give us a follow on all those awesome platforms. You can also sign up for our newsletter on our website, growingthefuturepodcast.ca, to get emails about our new episodes that are coming out. Today, do you lack clarity about your money? Would you like to improve your financial situation? Who wouldn't? Would you like to end your money anxiety? What is your relationship with money? This week, we have on the show a personal trainer for your money. Check this out. At the age of 26, she had already saved $250,000 and become a CEO, CEO and financial coach of Intentional Wealthy Coaching. She's read over 65 financial books. She's been on 45 plus podcasts. She's the CEO of Intentionally Wealthy, podcast host of Intentionally Wealthy, speaker and creator of cash flow confidence and unfuck your money. Credentials are she has helped her average client pay off close to $30,000 in debt, help clients to pay off over $1 million in debt. She's personally debt free. She has a multiple six figure investment portfolio. She's a financial coach academy graduate tapping into well certified coach EFT techniques practitioner NLP practitioner clinical hypnotherapist <laughs> she might be hypnotizing me on the podcast here stay tuned folks life and success coach third class power engineer what what I wonder what your Colby is a meditation teacher certified we may be there might be some meditation on podcasts which technically would be really boring because it'd just be silence but it'd be very soothing a holistic nutrition diploma wow uh, you can find mandy thomas on instagram at intentionally wealthy co on facebook at mandy thomas and online at mandy thomas.com that's mandy with two y's or you can tune into her podcast at intentionally wealthy podcast welcome to the show mandy thomas thank you so much for having me Right on. So today we're going to talk about how money beliefs translate over to the business side, how you help people with their variable expenses, things like simple things like how much you should be taking out of the farm because Mandy grew up on the farm and she's she's now farming and she she can help people with with the overwhelm of money and their mindset. And and we're going to talk a little bit about culture and agriculture uh, when it comes to money. But you know what's exciting too is I posted on Twitter yesterday a little bit of your story and asked for some questions from Ag Twitter, and we we're going to do a lightning round. That thing blew up. We have so many great questions from the audience that they want to know from you. Uh, I'm super stoked about this episode. So, Mandy, why don't you start by telling our listener who you are and a little bit about your journey and how you got to be doing what you do and why you're such a like evolved human being here? What is going on? Well, I grew up on a farm outside of a little tiny town called Big Beaver. There's about 12 people who live there, so tiny little place. And I never planned on being a financial coach whatsoever. So growing up, we didn't really have a lot of money. We had a small cow-calf operation, and then we farmed as well. And growing up, my mom had a really a lot of health struggles, and we have a very genetic heart condition in our family. My mom had it, uh, my little brother has it, so my mom couldn't really work. She was taking care of us four kids while my dad did the farming and everything. And I always just seen my parents struggling, and I knew from a young age that I didn't want to struggle like that. I knew somehow it could be different if I knew how to manage money. And so when I was 11, I started my first business. I started a pet sitting business because I wanted to be able to pay for my own stuff, my, my horses, clothes, some food. And, uh, and then when I was 14, I started my second business. I started basically getting horses, training them, selling them over a really crappy website that was free that I made. And, uh, and since then, I basically started managing my own money, really taking care of myself. And I kind of thought if I basically just did the opposite of my parents, I think I would do okay. And so that's when I started reading finance books. And uh, so I went to school to be a power engineer because I also thought, you know what, I want to have a good career. So I actually, you know, kind of have more money coming in the door. And what I realized in my early 20s was I became a power engineer. I managed my money well. I didn't have any debt. I was saving. I was investing. So I was doing really good on the strategic side, but I had not worked anything on the mindset side. Yes, of like knowing I could do better and being positive. 
but I hadn't dove into anything from childhood, working through any of the, you know, the really extreme scarcity beliefs. And what I found was I was doing really well financially, but from the mindset perspective, I was super scarce. I thought at any moment I was just going to lose everything. The oil field also wasn't the greatest place in 2015. There was people that were losing their jobs in the economy and different things like that. And I also came out into the economy in 2008, which also wasn't a great time for a lot of people. So I had seen that. And so I was just living from so much scarcity, but I felt like because I was actually doing well financially that I couldn't open up to anyone. So I just felt this like really internal shame because I felt like I, it made sense being stressed about money growing up because we didn't have much of it. But now that I was doing really well, why should I be stressed about money? And no one was talking about money. There wasn't really too many online coaches. No one was talking openly about money whatsoever. So I just kept it in and what ended up happening was in my mid twenties, I got extremely sick. I had a lot of memory issues. I actually thought it was early onset Alzheimer's when I was 25 years old because I was a power engineer and all these tasks that used to be easy to me all of a sudden were really hard. So what I was doing was I was carrying two notebooks in my, in my uh, coveralls and I wrote down how to do all these tasks that I used to know how to do. Cause I was in a safety sensitive position. If I did something wrong, I could get hurt or one of my coworkers could. And I started going to work and it felt like imposter syndrome because work used to be something that I was actually really good at. I was good as a power engineer and now it was a lot more tough for me because I had so many memory issues and I just kept getting sicker and sicker. And so I started to go down this, this rabbit hole trying to figure out like, what's my diagnosis? What's this external thing that's happening? And I finally realized that it wasn't this external thing. I didn't need some pill. It wasn't some specific thing that the doctors could help me fix. It was, I had so much stress worrying about money all the time. That's what I really needed to focus on. And once I started to work through that and I opened up to someone about that, a coach that I was working with actually on my anxiety and binge eating, because what would happen was I would get stressed about money. I would eat food. I would feel anxious and then I would eat food and then I'd feel crappy about myself. So when she started to say like, what's happening right before your anxiety goes through the roof. And I said, well, I started thinking about money and I went down this rabbit hole that, you know, I'd lose my job. We'd lose the house. I wouldn't have anything to eat. So it was really good to start to see like, where was that anxiety even coming from? And every single time it was coming from money. I would just be having a good day. A thought would pop in my head and then I would just get, so my reality in my head was completely different than the reality I was living in real life. But to me, it felt so real. And so I actually left my job as a power engineer doing shift work was way too hard to do nights anymore. I went back to school to study holistic nutrition. And when I was away at school studying that, cause I thought, well, that's what I want to help people with. And when I was away at school, that's when it really all came together when I was working with that coach. And I realized, cause it was a very strategic, more on the scientific end before. And when everything came together for me like that, I went, holy cow, this is how sick I got. Even though I wasn't in any debt, I had savings. I was able to do things that I wanted to do. I managed it well. If I got that sick, what about all these people who don't know how to manage their money well? And there's, there's accounts to help you with your taxes and tax strategy. And there's financial advisors. Once you feel like you have enough cash flow to be investing, there's no one in the, in between to help you with how do you actually do the daily managing of your money so you can get ahead. And also I felt like there's no one who can talk about money also from the holistic standpoint of not just talking about it being stressful, but really understanding how it affects your physical health, how it affects your mental health, how it affects all those other aspects. So instead of just talking about it from a number standpoint, yes, absolutely. That's really important, but also gets that that's where I realized, okay, you know what, what I actually want to do is help people with their money. And I said, I'm going to be a financial coach. People thought that I was kind of crazy because in Canada, financial coaching, you know, four years ago was not a thing. I was one of the first financial coaches in Canada. It's much bigger now than it was before. And I said, I don't know how I'm going to make this work. I don't know how to market myself, but I went through all these struggles for a reason. You know, this, I was not a victim. This was a gift because I can talk about money very differently than other people. And basically I have been coaching clients for four years now because yes, I love helping my clients pay off their debt and save money. But for me, what I really care about is people who can actually sleep now and they're not staying up all night or waking up in the middle of the night because they're worried about money and physically and mentally, they're just so much healthier because we figured it out. And so that's kind of led us to, to where we are today. 
<laughs> wow. That is an incredible story. What I'm wondering is, how does your mindset physically make money sticky? Because I think money sticks to some people and for some people it just magically flows away and never comes back. Money is an energy. And, and I know a lot of people who are extremely successful and they're absolutely ordinary people. But the difference is mindset. That's how you get rich. So talk to us a little bit about the nuts and bolts and the yellow brick road to getting there to actually making money stick to you with your mindset. Yeah, so it's really the biggest thing is how we feel about money. A lot of times it's not like the beliefs that we have around money. Most of the time we haven't actually chosen them ourselves. What's happened is under the age of seven, a lot of those beliefs are very set in stone. So it's the things you heard your parents say. It's the things that you've seen your parents do. It's how they felt about money. And we are just like little sponges as kids. And even if we don't know exactly what's going on, we feel things very deeply. We pick up on that. And so a lot of times, you know, hearing like, well, we can't afford that. And if you hear that a lot growing up, then really when you become an adult, instead of thinking like, okay, you know what? This thing's really important to me. How can I afford it? Which is a question that opens up opportunity. A lot of times we are just so stuck in that I can't afford it. So a lot of times we're making either short-term decisions or we're constantly feeling disempowered about money that it doesn't try and expand us. It keeps us contracted. So really a big thing is diving in. What did your parents say about money? How did they handle it? Was there one parent that was maybe more controlling around money? Maybe the other one spent a lot more freely. So sometimes you'll almost see a rebellion with money. One parent's really controlling. One feels like, you know, a saver and a spender. Super common in a relationship, there's a saver and a spender. And typically, the spender is the person who feels like this person's, you know, the saver's trying to constrict them. And then they'll almost be a little bit more rebellious. So you can sometimes see that maybe in your parents growing up. And maybe that it felt um, disempowering that they weren't, you know, allowed to spend the money. So then... A lot of times what we're doing is we also have patterns that are happening in our life because of patterns that we've seen in childhood or if a parent was maybe away from home more so then they would shower you more with gifts because they felt bad that they weren't there or that they were even if they were home they just felt bad maybe they were always working on the farm and even though they were there they didn't get to maybe see you as much so then you almost equate love with gifts so maybe you overspend different things like that so a big thing is just diving into how did your parents talk about money growing up? How did they feel about money? What was that like? That's one of the biggest things because constantly growing up is we, we can't afford it. Anytime that I would ask my dad, can I do this? He'd always say, ask your mother. He never, ever gave me an answer, anything money related. It was always talk to her. And then I knew sometimes I asked her and sometimes I didn't because I knew the answer was, it was probably going to be, we don't have enough money. So then after a while as a kid, it feels like rejection and abandonment. And those are two emotions that really, really deeply drive us. So that's a big thing is asking yourself, like, how did money feel growing up? What did our parents constantly say? Was it money doesn't grow on trees? Well, then as an adult, you might not think about all these other opportunities. We live in a completely different time now than our parents did. Financial coaching wasn't a thing when I was 18 years old. It wasn't even a thing, you know, as in, in my early twenties. And then I literally felt like I made it up. So that's where there's so many more opportunities that we can create now, but depending on our parents' experiences and how they felt about their life and the things that we heard from them really has a big effect on, on us. So the big thing is just saying, you know, literally writing down, like, what are the things that you constantly say about money and how you feel about money and asking yourself, do I actually feel this way? Or was it, you know, the experiences growing up and do I want to continue to believe that? Will that get me? to where it is that I want to go and the things that what I want to do. So do I need to choose a new belief? Is that something that's empowering me to be expansive? Or is that something that's contracting me? Because for me, I was super contracted very much. So, cause all I was doing was really thinking from that scarcity mindset. There were certain, certain areas where I was doing really well, but that was a huge bottleneck for me. I was because especially the sicker I got, you can't make more money. You also can't manage it as well. So I really needed to, basically it's the wounding, wounding from childhood a lot of times and bless our parents, they really did the best they could with the resources they had. There's so much more knowledge now that we have, but so it's never ever blaming them. We're not ever blaming our parents or anyone, but it's just seeing like, what did they say? What were those patterns and us being aware of that and choosing differently. And it's, it's not easy because it's so ingrained in us. But it's something that once you become aware, you do have to keep making that conscious choice going forward with how you feel about money. 
So doing, doing a lot of working around that. And sometimes it's, you know, you got to go through and you got to process those things so you can move forward. This is incredible. I've just had like multiple breakthroughs. I feel like I should be paying you for coaching right now, Mandy, because I'm sure that everybody listening to this can, can relate to what you're saying, whether they're the saver or the spender or thinking of themselves as the child or the parent. Yeah, I, my, my five-year-old's here right now. And what you're saying is really, really resonating me with me. And not only that, but you're making connections between money and, and food and interpersonal relationships. So how much time are you spending on coaching people about money versus these other areas that you see impinging on how they conduct themselves with money? Yeah, so what I find when I very first started coaching, I thought I'm going to start on the mindset first, really help them get their mindset right, and then we'll do the tangibles. But what I realized was people really needed to see actual tangible results right away and see that they can actually make improvements because a lot of times they haven't been feeling hope. They've been feeling like they've been trying to budget and it hasn't been working and they are frustrated when they come to me. So what I realized was I really did need to flip it the other way. What I find works really good with my clients is for us to start on the tangible side start on the strategic side, get them actually feeling confident with the numbers first, get them paying off more debt, get them making improvements. And then it seems like they're a lot more open to starting to talk about how they're, what I call like their family money paradigm to actually dive into that. Cause everyone at first, like it's meeting them where they're at with what they're consciously aware of is the problem starting there, helping to solve that problem. And then we can go deeper. It's almost like I need to build up their trust first there. So I definitely, you know, like to spend basically the first 12 weeks of working with someone really working on getting a lot of that, like financial foundation in place. And then it's almost like they're, they're ready to go deeper. They're real. They're starting to realize now it's not just about managing their cash flow. It's way more because if you, if you don't feel like you deserve more money, you're never going to make more. We have to work through like worthiness wounds. And that's one of the things when someone feels like they've maybe been stuck at an income level and they're trying to exceed it. A lot of times what that comes back to is really unconsciously what's happening is we are afraid to out earn our parents because they probably worked so hard for the money they had. And it feels almost disrespectful. And it's really interesting. There's a correlation, especially for, for women to make more than their dads. It feels very, very disrespectful. Even if you feel like your parents would be happy for you, we are so worried about disempowering our parents and basically being put outside of the tribe. Because back in the day, if you did something to make your, your tribe of people really upset and you were out on your own, there's a good chance you're going to die. And we are hardwired for survival, not for joy and for pleasure. So really looking at that family money paradigm. And when you can start to dive into that and see where that, where that really sits, how, how your family thinks about money, how they did and how they still do, you can start to realize, you know, I probably need to choose some new beliefs. Cause I've had clients come to me and say, well, my, my parents filed bankruptcy. My brother filed bankruptcy. I'm just going to have to file bankruptcy. And I'm like, you don't have to, but you have to change your belief. Or another client said, well, my dad said, you always have a car loan. There's no way you can't. And I said, if you keep believing that it's true, I don't have a car payment. I never plan on having one going forward. I really like paying cash for my vehicles. So that's where just diving into that and realizing like that's probably keeping you stuck there. Love it. Wow, that's very interesting. So I'm wondering what kind of clients are you working with? You're from the farm and you guys are farming now. D does any of this apply to, do your money beliefs apply to your business as a farm? Absolutely. So that's one thing when I work with anyone who's self-employed, you really have to look at both the personal side and the business side, because how we manage the personal side and how we think about the personal side has a huge effect on the business. So when we think of them as really two separate entities and only try and work on one that has a very negative effect on the other. So you absolutely really have to be looking at both. Cause for example, if you're just focused, let's say on the business side and you don't dive into the personal side, 
Well, you really don't even know how much you need to be paying yourself. You don't know if that's enough, if it's not enough, but you also don't know if you're maybe really overspending personally, that it's also affecting the business. Cause I've seen, I've seen both of those situations before. So you really need to dive into both of them. And it's kind of like, like you need to think of it holistically that they are not completely external. Whatever happens in the one affects the other. Cause for example, let's say if maybe if your relationship's struggling, you will notice it coming out, you know, in the business. Everything from personal will affect business and business will affect personal. So we really do have to think of them, you know, as, as the, as the system that totally affects one another. So as it relates to agriculture, what do you think can be improved upon in terms of, of the mindset that's out there? Obviously we have a very distinct culture. Uh, what, what would you like to improve the most in the agricultural scene when it comes to money beliefs? Yeah, I think each person really diving into why do you believe the things that you do about money? Because a lot of farm families have experienced scarcity. It's a, it's a huge underlying, you know, our grandparents grew up in a very different time. My grandparents were quite a bit older, so they grew up in a, in a very different time and really seeing like, that's probably where your beliefs stem from. And we need to really change change the beliefs that we have, what we think to be true about money and asking yourself, like, is this actually true? Is it true if it's how you know if something's true? It's, it's a universal truth if it applies to everyone. If it doesn't apply to everyone, then it's it's not an actual truth. It's something you believe to be true about money, but isn't necessarily. So that's really important is to ask yourself, like if I, the way that I want to take my farming operation or whatever that may be, the beliefs I currently have, are they gonna get me there? Or do I need to do some work on them? Like, are they gonna serve me well going forward? So that's really important. And what's going to happen is it's not like, boom, all of a sudden you're just going to choose these new beliefs and everything's going to be, you know, butterflies and rainbows. It's something we constantly have to just keep catching ourselves when we're thinking those things, or we're saying those things. Like one of the things my dad always said growing up was whenever you have some money come in, whether that is, you know, we've sold some cattle or we've sold some grain. He says, the money's already gone. Basically, as soon as any money comes in, it's already gone. And <laughs> So that was something that I had to really work through that that's not, that doesn't have to be true for me. I can do things like savings buckets. So I'm setting a little bit of money aside each time. So when those bigger expenses come up, it's not like, boom, everything's suddenly gone. So it's really important for us to just ask ourselves this, but also ask your partner, whether that is, you know, a, a, a spouse or if it's a business partner, but you know, so diving into that on both of you, cause maybe you've had similar experiences but there's a lot of times you've had different experiences as well, or you could have both had very similar experiences, but felt very, very differently about it. One person, it might not have bothered as much. The other person might be really coming from that, like really extreme scarcity. And, and I tend to see it actually for women. I see it's a little bit worse sometimes because I think sometimes like, you know, you're the ones who have the reproductive organs. So you kind of have to carry on the species. <laughs> so I really do think sometimes I see with women, they need to feel more safe and secure for the most part. So sometimes they might have a little bit more negative thinking. So that's also important to see where I, a lot of times see in a relationship, both people see the financial situation and one person's way more stressed about it than the other person. So it's a lot easier for you to understand it when you know about the experiences that you've both had around money and how you felt about it. So I really think if we dive into like how we actually feel about money, it will change the decisions we make. It will change the way that we, we think about things, which entirely affects the operations that we have. I can see that uh, you very much are a life coach because you're addressing all these different things. I just want to ask one last question before we start to get into some of these Twitter questions because I keep thinking of things to ask and I realize other people have asked this very deliberately and very succinctly. So we're going to unpack everybody's questions on that thread that went viral. But my question is, so we've talked about money and food and relationships, but what about coaching when it comes to actually getting coaching? What are some of the beliefs that you have to break through to, to get people to recognize it's worth paying good money to invest in yourself, to have a coach in all of these different areas that help you, ex you know, succeed and exceed expectations. I mean, you can't lift as much unless you have a trainer. You can't make as much unless you have a financial coach. You know, what, what, what resistance, especially as it relates to agriculture, do you have to break through to, to make people coachable? I think one of the first ones to get them even on the coaching journey is them understanding, like people are like, 
you want me to pay you to help me with my money when I'm struggling. How does that even work? Right. So that's the very first one. So really talking them through, well, you've been trying to do this on your own and it hasn't been working. It's actually been costing you more, more money in interest rates that you're paying in, in debt piling up in the money that you don't have growing in investments, but also in your emotional health, it's been affecting your relationships. So basically talking about, okay, it's already cost you a lot of money and it's going to keep costing you that money. Yes, this is an investment. I don't say it costs to work with me. It's an investment. It's an investment in yourself. And really just seeing, hey, if we work together for 12 weeks or six months or longer, whatever that looks like, this is going to pay off a much bigger ROI. So really talking to them about you don't have the skills right now or kind of the mindset right now to get where you want to be and just asking them, like, what is it you want? So a lot of times when we're stressed about money, we're just thinking about the day to day about constantly putting out little fires. So I'll also say like, what do you actually want to do? Like six months from now, what would feel good? But then let's also take it bigger and let's talk about, okay, let's say all your debts paid off. You've got money in savings. You got an emergency fund. Tell me like, what are your dreams? And when I ask that question on the phone, it usually goes silent. And I just sit there. People are thinking, and I will get, you know what, Maddie, that's actually a really great question because they forgot They've literally forgot to stop dreaming about what they really want. So helping them to get that clarity back and saying, that's not what you're focused on right now. I want to help you to get that day to day in place. So those dreams can start coming true. They're not going to happen overnight, but we need to get this in place so that that can come true. So really just talking them through, you know, the struggles you have, you're stuck there. Let, let's move through that. And that's what I help my clients with. And it's both tangible and it's also on the mindset and the wounding side. Whoa. I love it. I mean, this is great. Sign me up. I want it. I want it. Let's take a brief break and we're going to come back very, very shortly with the hashtag egg Twitter lightning round, all the questions from the audience that they're dying to know about you. And I'm telling you, everybody, this whole 250K savings thing by 26, I mean, these people want to know how you did that. So uh, we'll be right. We'll be right back. Today's episode is brought to you by GFL Agriculture, formerly known as BioCycle Solutions. For more than 10 years, they have been turning leftover food into valuable fertility solutions for farmers. You might have heard of it, BioSalt, Premium Plus. Bringing organics full circle by returning it to the soil as nutrition has given way for growers to feed their crops what they need using a sustainable, environmentally efficient model. To learn more, visit gfleb.com. And also, Replenish. Shout out to our partners and friends at Replenish Nutrients. Replenish is famous for creating super KS, sustain and rebuilder fertilizers, these regenerative soil health solutions give farmers an alternative to conventional products with the side benefit of improving soil quality for the long haul. Fall weather is a good time to apply FOSS and potassium to your soil. We're spreading to beat the band right now. Check them out at replenishnutrients.com. Hey folks, today I'm going to share with you the answers to your questions from the Egg Twitter lightning round where I asked folks on Twitter, hey, I'm interviewing a personal finance coach who happens to farm as well. She managed to save $250,000 by the tender age of 26. But I am going to ask of Mandy these questions that have been provided uh, by the audience uh, directly and post them to Twitter. Uh, top of the thread here. This thread just went viral, by the way, Mandy. It just the people are just really fascinated. So, uh, the farm babe at the farm babe. Farm babe says, "Super interesting. Would love to learn more." Only time I was ever dis- able to save a ton was when I was living with a boyfriend, who paid the mortgage, and other major living expenses. She's in the same boat. What do they farm? Yeah. So my husband, he runs, they run the operation with, uh, with his family. So they have 400 head of commercial cattle. And then also on top of that, then they have uh, a grain farm. So they plant 6,000 acres and kind of barley, canola, peas, lentils, and then some green feed for their cattle as well. And where are you guys located? We're just outside of milestone. So just half hour south of Regina. Love it. Um, John, at the bird farmer asks if she saved 250,000 what was her income before 26 what was she given to be able to invest this is a lot, big big theme of the thread everybody thinks you were given land or inherited what was she given to be able to invest to save 250,000 bucks from the profits too many people say they save not realizing to save they have to have something first to be able to save it 
Yeah. So nothing was given to me. This was all from the income that I, so I worked as a power engineer for four years. And like I said, I had that scarcity mindset and I was, you know, making kind of big girl money. And so I set a lot of that aside. So what I did was kind of a combination. As soon as I got paid, I set it up. So anywhere between like 10 and 18% of my income, I never even seen that paycheck hit my bank account. So that automatically went to investments. Didn't fully know what I was doing for investments yet, but I was like, I'm just going to start doing this. And then on top of that, additionally per paycheck, I would take money from that. I would also set aside anytime I got a tax refund. I never touched it. The second that it hit my bank account, it went into my investments. Any, uh, I did get a bonus each year from work as well. That went in there. So anytime there was any big amount of money that came in from those types of things. Uh, cause I didn't get anything. It was all simply just from being a power engineer. All of that money directly went towards investments. And I just really lived hugely. Yes, I did have a six figure income, but I really, really lived below my means for a lot of aspects in my life. I made really good money, the same money that the guys I was working with, but I spent way less than they did. And I just put it all away. And also I never, ever touched any of that money. So then it, it grew as well. Nice. Uh, you might've touched on it in your previous response there, but Ryan Herring at Herring underscore Ryan asks, what percent of your income should one be putting into the rainy day fund that almost no one has hashtag lifestyle changes? <laughs> So great question. I wish that I had like a perfect answer, but what I'm just going to tell you is, so when I work with my clients, I tell them there's a big difference between an emergency fund and savings buckets. So everyone thinks that they just need an emergency fund, but what's happening is emergency funds are, they're never growing. They're constantly being dipped into. So what you do need is you need two things. Savings buckets are for those expenses that are going to come up that they aren't monthly. So clothing, gifts, travel, anything like that, uh, vet bills, um, kids stuff. I have every single client has a typically about eight different savings accounts that they put money into those every single month. Those are what I call like short-term savings. They're going to be using those savings. And then they work on building up a separate emergency fund for actual like loss of income, health struggle, that sort of thing, because we want that emergency fund to not be touched. So that's where it's kind of hard to say a certain percentage because every other financial person basically just kind of operates on just have an emergency fund, but everyone's dipping into it. So what I would say is, you know, start to figure out what those savings buckets are. And I would love to, I have a, a spreadsheet that we can link in the show notes that anyone can download that they want that helps walk them through actually figuring out what they should put into those for their lifestyle. And then what you would want to do for the emergency fund is it's going to take you years to build that up. Everyone makes it seem like it should take you three months and you should have an emergency fund. No, most people don't have enough cash flow for that. So really seeing an emergency fund is this is probably going to take you for most people three plus years to build up, you know, three months worth of living expenses. So that's a really important to keep that in mind. So having those short term savings buckets and then yes, open up an emergency fund even if you just start putting a small amount into it, but know that that's going to take you years to, to be able to achieve that. So it doesn't feel like a failure when it's taking a while to get there. Nice. Uh, Mike Stott at Black Pearl 152. Does she own stocks within a TFSA? Hashtag buy deer. <laughs> Yes. So I do have certain stocks. So I have my RSP and my tax free. That's what I do my investing inside of. And I have some of them that are a lot of them in like low cost index funds through my one side of my portfolio. And then the other side of my portfolio, that's much smaller because it's like more, I treat it as more of like my play money as I'm figuring out. But yes, I do hold stocks within there as well. I just don't hold American stocks. I hold those inside of my RSP. I make sure that they're Canadian stocks that I'm holding inside of my tax free. Sweet. Danny Audenbright from at O2 Farms underscore Sask, how does one slow down the rate money leaves the farm and increases the rate money comes into the farm? Also, what's some good basics for managing cash flow? We could do an entire episode on that one topic. It's so, there's so many aspects to it. But one of the things I would say is you need to make sure that you're doing a lot of like actual strategic planning. Cause if you're just trying to handle like the day to day as things are coming, you're constantly going to feel behind. That's the same with your personal finances. So a big thing I would say is really like all of the people sitting down, going through the money and really just kind of seeing like when throughout the year are those more, the times when you have more cash flow coming in when you, you know, you're typically kind of selling different things and then really seeing, okay, all the payments and different things like that. 
and just making sure that you're, you got to be pretty strategic about it. You cannot keep this all in your head. It has to be down on paper, whether that's putting it on, you know, a Google doc or a spreadsheet, but you need to get it out of your head. And you also need everyone else to see it as well. Cause even in, let's say, if we're just talking about personal finances, even between a relationship, both people really need to see, you know, the aspects of, of what's going on there. It's the same with the farming operation. So people can be making decisions, but have no idea that maybe you don't even have the cash flow for that. So it, that's so important. You just have to be really taking a lot of time to sit down, to go through the numbers and not just from a bookkeeping standpoint. That's a really big difference. If you're doing things for bookkeeping, that's for your tax purposes. That's important for CRA. But what you really need to be doing is cash flow management. You really need to be looking ahead three and six months ahead. No, you, you can't plan everything and everything isn't perfect. But if you can tell that you're probably going to be in a pretty tight spot, it's easier to make decisions now to help and try and avoid that. Danny, you need to hire Mandy Thomas. Let's be real. Corey Peters, you know, I don't know if this is going to be in your wheelhouse, but it turned into a really big discussion uh, amongst the farmers on Twitter. But Corey Peter at Corey Peters asked, would be curious on her thoughts on leasing equipment versus purchasing and what works best on an average farm uh, budget per tax year. Uh, I know every situation is different, just seems to come up and topic a lot more last couple of years with low interest rates. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so that's going to be so dependent on your specific situation. I'll say for personal, when we're not talking about farming, I hate leasing. <laughs> for the most part, for most businesses, I really don't like leasing. I think that it does not, the pros don't outweigh the cons. Farming, very different. It's going to, I wish that I could give an awesome, sweet little answer, but it's going to be so, so dependent on your specific situation. Because you also have to take into account, uh, typically leasing is a lot higher cost, but you have to take into account the potential downtime that you don't have and different things like that. So, and, and peace of mind because you're running newer machinery. So there's a lot of things to take into account, not just the financial aspect, but how you feel kind of emotionally as well too. Whew, lost to consider. Uh, at Daryl Fransu, my good buddy, Daryl Fransu asks a great question. What is the worst purchase you have ever made? Ooh, that's a, that's a good question. <laughs> I will say it, it's not the actual purchase itself. It's yeah. why I made the purchase. So, uh, I show, I used to show horses at a high level and I'm getting back into that. And there was this really beautiful, uh, showmanship jacket. It was 2,400 bucks is what I paid for it. And <laughs> it wasn't, I, I cash flowed it. It didn't go on debt, but it was really that I was coming from it. Cause I was more in a pissed off state of mind in my life. Like I was kind of really upset about stuff and I didn't know how to voice my opinion. So instead I went, you know what? I went through a lot of crappy things, so I'm going to buy this and I deserve it. And I love the jacket. I ended up selling it for the exact same I paid for it. So I didn't lose. But it was learning that me being really emotional and buying it from the wrong place. Interesting. Okay, Norman Rasmussen asks, uh, would you be interested to know if, would be interested to know if she moved out of home immediately, stayed at home, etc. Myself, buying a house straight out of high school turned out to be a great investment, tougher to do now than in 2000. Yeah, so I... When I very first finished high school, I started in the oil field as a pipeline laborer. So I did that for a year and I ended up having really bad chest pains. And so I went to the hospital. We couldn't figure out what it was and it lasted for probably about a month straight. So I ended up leaving that job. I, I moved home. So I would have been about 19 at that time. I was at home for eight months just trying to get healthier because this, this pain was constant in my chest. And I was really worried and I was doing an extremely physical job. So I quit doing that. I moved home. I just helped my dad out for the, the spring and the summer with getting the crop in and that sort of thing. Then I went to school as a power engineer for two years. I didn't live at home. And then when I was working as a power engineer at that time, I basically lived in two places because I worked away from home. So I lived with my husband. We were just dating at that time. I lived with him and his family for about three years. And then, so I lived with them about half the time. And then when I was working the other half, I rented in Weyburn. So kind of that combination. And then when we got married, we bought a house and then we lived on our own. So I will say I am, I am a fan of anyone who can live at home for a little bit longer. I have mm -hmm. no shame in that, no embarrassment at all. But I will say it's significantly different buying a house now than it ever has been. And that if you don't have, you know, people helping you out, it can be a lot more difficult. We didn't have someone help us out, but I'm just saying, so when people, when it feels tough not to feel bad, because it, it takes so much more work to be able to buy a house now than it ever did before. 
Indeed, indeed. Uh, Kyle at Yuhu26, what's your thoughts on economy of scale and how timing of growth can have implications? Ooh, that's a pretty, pretty loaded question. That's something I wish I could dive into, but there's so many variables that it would be hard <laughs> to even touch that. <laughs> you got to buy the online course, Kyle. Get real here. Um, Chris Downey at First Gen Farmer. What era did she manage to scrape, scrape up 250K and how did she start farming with a million? I'm sure to end up with 250K. The old farming adages start with a million and end up with nothing. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So that was really everything. Just came from from my power engineering career, and then my husband, his family has farmed forever, and uh, so I married my husband, and he's he's farmed, and they have cattle. So that's really where that aspect came in. So I don't personally farm; my husband does, and then I just uh, help out the small amounts that I can because my my business is is full time, and I'm scaling it as well. So. I don't want to take away. My husband's the one who is doing all of the work there. I'm really just uh, helping out more so with meals and that sort of thing. But um, yeah. Gunter Joachim at GM, J-O-C-H-U-M. How's it going, buddy? Why did she only save 250K? What prevented her from hitting a cool million? Like, were you slacking? Were you slacking, Mandy? I definitely needed to have worked as a power engineer for longer. I'll say that. <laughs> and uh, I would have needed to have the knowledge I have now back then would have made a big difference too. Yeah. 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 Um, Dan Jones at Jones 6807 said, I'm married, but I'm sure someone would love to know if she's single. And I mean, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people would love to combine romance with somebody that can manage their money. But she's already very explained married. that she's very married. Very, very married. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Kendall Gee at Kendall Gee asks, what personal fi- this is a good one. What personal finance myths does she see as costing people the most? One of the big things is when it comes to setting money aside for h- how we're managing our money on, on a day-to-day basis. One of the big things is not putting like understanding the difference between saving and investing really. Like everyone says, you know, you need to save this much. I really don't think so. I think what we need to do is we need to have these savings buckets where we're saving all that money that is basically going to be used in the next, you know, three months to to 12 months. And then understanding that because what we hear conventionally is you need to set aside 10% of your income. You need to save 10% of your income. That is so not true. It has to actually be way, way more than that because we need to distinguish the difference between saving and investing. Saving, you're never going to get ahead of inflation. And your money is never going to grow. So you need to really be comfortable. Okay, you have your savings buckets. That's for saving. You need to be investing at least 10%. And it really depends on what your income is. Because if your income's pretty low, you you would need to be investing even more than that. So really just honestly understanding the difference in the terminology and what that actually means for what you're doing behind the scenes. So investing, like I, I had said before, I invested 10 to 18% plus any time I had that extra money coming in. And I was saving on top of that as well. And hire a coach. And hire a coach. Absolutely. It, this is a, that would, what you said is a nice segue to J- John at Iron Healer's uh, question or comment. I always invested the money back into myself somehow. That's technically saving, no? So it, you can look at it kind of two different ways. So I do think that investing in yourself is one of the amazing ways to invest, but you have to also make sure that you, you have your money growing as well. So even if it's just a small amount, I would urge you to just even start investing like outside, like actual investing, like retirement, long-term investments, even just start with small amounts there, but making it the goal that when you're investing in yourself, that you're able to get an ROI that is either making more money or you're able to, you know, really leverage that as well. So for example, there was a time when I went back to school, I did not have an income coming in. I will also say that I did not have any income coming in. I, and then once I started my business, I also did not take a job anywhere else. So I was living off of savings, but I knew that ultimately it was going to really get me ahead. So I was investing in myself at that time, not in my investments, only simply in me to learn how to actually run a business, how to actually get clients. But I made sure that it was a priority that I didn't keep that life that I only focused on that, that I eventually got to the point where, yes, I'm still investing in myself in the business, 
but also I'm investing in my retirement and my long-term investments again. So really just, you know, it needs to be kind of that fine balance. So it's, there's a difference when you're in like a startup, you really probably aren't able to invest much outside. You really solely are investing in yourself and in your business and that's okay. But understanding there has to be a point where you're starting to make more profit and you're able to invest outside as well. Awesome. Uh, Curtis Hoffman at freedom underscore speech one comments. Sounds like a good interview. Saving that much is impressive. Wondering what age you started working. Did you get an education? So we've already covered all those facts. We won't go there again, but he did make some comments. 250 K over eight years. is just over 31 K saved per year. That's more than I made per year. That's more than I made per year as a first, second and third welder. I never missed a day of work in three years. <laughs> Puts in perspective. Uh, Scott Keller at Ske- uh, S. Keller Farms asks, what's your favorite book and why is it The Wealthy Barber? Uh, I did absolutely love that book. That was a really, really great one. And I also, I just loved his perspective. So that was, that was a great book. I'm going to say two other books that I really like too. I had read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I think when I was about 16 or 17. And for me, I had lived a lifestyle where I'd only seen, you know, how my parents were growing up. And that just made me feel like there were so many other possibilities. And it made me, I already was pretty entrepreneurial starting those first two businesses, but I didn't know anything else outside of that. And it made me just go, you know what? I don't know what else I could do as an entrepreneur, but I know I want to be one one day and I want to get into rental properties. I haven't yet. Um, So really love that book. That really changed everything for me. And the compound effect I think it's by Darren Hardy. I hope I didn't say his name right uh, wrong. But those two also, I love those books as well. Do you have a book list of the 65 plus books or your top top five books or something that you that you share with clients? I, I'm careful actually now about sharing book lists because what I find is a lot of times people are doing really passive learning. They, f- they feel really motivated, right. but they read the entire book really fast and they didn't do anything. So I actually called that out on my <laughs> podcast saying, how many books are you, are you reading and how many podcasts are you listening to, but not actually doing anything. So I'll say, I'd rather actually have you doing stuff than reading a book. So it's kind of funny. My perspective's really changed. I'm careful about giving out book recommendations now. Guilty as charged. Uh, Farmer J at Jason T. Kachuk, why would you be saving cash when real inflation rates are higher than any cash-based investments I've seen? I made a million by 25, flatlined the next decade or so. Yeah, so that wasn't 250 just saved. There was there was a portion of that that was saved, and then quite a bit of it was invested as well. I did carry a bigger amount that was in savings versus um, what a lot of other people would have did. But I was also getting really sick and I just had a feeling I was going to, my, my doctor told me two years before I left my job that I would need to. So I also kept some that was more liquid because I didn't know what that would look like. But yeah, super important to be investing, but things can also, you know, things can, can change there as well. Things can really dip. So really taking that long-term strategy and being able to not be emotional and pull out at the worst possible time. That's one of the things I think is really important to bring up is when I came out into the workforce in 2008 and I started as a pipeline laborer. So I would have been 18. A lot of the guys that I was working with were 40, 45 years old ish. All I kept hearing from them was about everything had dropped. Like it wasn't a good time in the world. We were in a recession then. And all I kept hearing was how they lost all like 60% of their money. And from someone who already felt pretty scarce, that really freaked me out. But I didn't understand at that time that they didn't lose unless they pulled the money out. And that's kind of what I've seen is when things really get down, a lot of people pulling their money out at the worst possible times and really realizing those, um, those losses. The other thing is really spending a lot of time learning about investments. My investment strategy is so different than it used to be. Uh, so that's another big thing is just that has been been a big part of my journey as well as really learning in depth about investing so I could try and get the best returns basically that I could. Right. So Jason Hildebrand at Jason underscore Hildo was asking, my question would be is how those savings have been invested early. How could those savings have been invested earlier to yield potential equity dividends today? But you've already covered that you had some of it invested. Is that fair? That is fair. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is a this is a indicative of a set of a beliefs here, and this one this particular comment got forty likes. So, uh, Shulky, Shulky Core at Shulky Core said or asks how much land was given to her, but you don't you don't have to answer that because the answer is none. I okay? didn't I didn't have any that was given to me. No. Yeah, perfect. Uh, that's all you need to say. But that's an interesting. Uh, 
reflection of of um, what you naturally assume. Um, Mark August guy at Mark August guy. Why in the world did she save two fifty rather than using it as a downstroke on something leveraged? Why don't oh. you? Yeah, I guess he's saying that you should have maybe invested it or leveraged, like took a loan on something. But go yeah, ahead. definitely had it in investments, and I would have loved to have used it on something else. But at the time, it was the knowledge that I had, and just being, you know, there there wasn't as many opportunities to understand about investing back then because I actually really wanted to get into real estate when I was in my kind of early to mid 20s but back then there was not the information there was now I actually took a year-long program about it but it was American based and I felt like the information was so completely different being a Canadian so I was I was looking for opportunities but back then I just had a hard time finding them because the internet is not what it is now final question you've done amazing you've answered a bunch of hard questions uh, very well you're a professional. Uh, Rizzo asks, are you up for adopting an older child? <laughs> I will pass on that. <laughs> She's good. She's good. She's got lots on her plate. I, I, have, but... I have horses and they take enough <laughs> of my money. I love my horses and uh, they, they are like children. <laughs> look, look, she has clients of which you can become one. How would people find you online? How would people connect with you? How would people become a client of yours? Yeah, so the best place is to reach out to me on Instagram. That's where I'm most active. So it's at Intentionally Wealthy Co. And you can also listen to me on the podcast to really, you know, understand, get a more of a feel for how I work with clients, my thought process. So that's Intentionally Wealthy. And uh, if you want to talk with me, what I always do is I always make sure, are we actually a good fit to work together? Because there's some people that I know based on their situation, they're not a good fit. And I'll just be straight up honest. So then neither of us waste our time. So in that case, what I do is I have clients fill out or potential clients fill out an application form that gives me more information so I can understand more about your situation. And then you get booked in for a call. doesn't cost to talk with me. And then we have a call and then we can just go deeper on that. And then I can tell you, do I think, you know, we're a good fit to work together? And what would that specifically look like? Would it be one-on-one -on -one coaching or would it be my group program? Um, or if there's something, something different. Look, I'm very, I'm very coachable, Mandy. Let's be real. Like, and some of you are not that coachable. I, I am very coachable, but uh, no, I love the whole coaching thing. As you know, as a listener of the show, my brother and I have just benefited so much from being around people that are vastly superior to us and are in their area of expertise. And uh, for anyone who gets the benefit of listening to this full show at the beginning, you'll hear everything that Mandy's accomplished at and, and on her bio, you can go on to uh, mandythomas.com with, with two Y's and read more about her story there. But it's absolutely incredible to connect with you. And I, I love what you do. I think it's incredibly valuable. And it's something we should all be, you know, we touched on our, in our other portion of our interview more about uh, beliefs that we get as young people. And I think one of the most powerful pieces here is if you can, help people overcome their beliefs about money and address those. And we can get this down to our children, something that is not taught in school. Your life trajectory is vastly different depending on how you see the world and how you bring up your kids and how you were brought up. So today, like you say, we have a bold new era where, where coaching is, is a thing and people like yourself are helping others succeed. And, and I, I'm just incredibly excited uh, by what you're doing. I'm very honored to have you on the show. So thanks for coming on the show, Mandy. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. And I would just love to leave just a, a couple of final words, if that's okay. Absolutely. Um, because of based on the questions that people asked on Twitter, which were awesome, there's a couple of podcast episodes I'd love for you to listen to, to give you more context than what we could go into today. And so it's episode two of my podcast. That's, I literally break down like 14 steps of how I save that much money. So I can be a lot more specific in that one. Um, episode three talks about savings buckets. That's a huge thing. That's an absolute game changer for my clients. That's an amazing one. And then because we talked about like the family money paradigm, I'd love for you to hear more about that because we only got to, you know, we can only have so much time to cover it. But on my podcast, that is episode number uh, 23. That goes a lot more in depth about the family money paradigm, which I think is every single person really needs to dive into that. So those are just three episodes. If you would love to dive into, you can check those out specifically. Awesome. I'm going to put those links on the, on the YouTube 
that I'm going to share with everyone that was kind enough to ask some some great questions. I loved it. It's great interaction. And uh, I think this kind of coaching is is needed in agriculture. Very welcome. So um, say hi to your husband for me. I appreciate uh, you coming on the show. And, and thanks so much. I'm really looking forward to this, you know, publishing of this episode. And I think uh, we might have to talk later because I, I think uh, – I like to be coached too. So obviously uh, there's lots of areas I could still improve on. So thanks for coming on the show, Manny. It's awesome to have you. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. All right. Take care. Thank you. 